They say the Mongol Empire ended seven centuries ago. But your blood might disagree. Because what if the greatest empire in history didn't vanish? It just changed form. Not in stone, not in ruins. But in you. Across Asia today, from the forests of Korea to the deserts of Iran, over 16 million men carry the same strange mark. Not a scar. A chromosome. A silent signature that traces back to one ancient male. One father, whose name may still echo inside your DNA. And here's the shock. This genetic ghost didn't disappear with his empire. He multiplied, silently, aggressively, until his lineage outlived his nation, his name, even his tomb. Scientists call it a super lineage, a Y chromosome so widespread, it rewired the genetic story of entire regions. But no one told you that. No one told you the conquest didn't stop with cities and swords. It moved into bloodlines, into marriages, into children, into the unspoken history of your family tree. So the question is no longer if the Mongol Empire survived. It's where. And if one invisible lineage still shapes the lives of millions today, then where did this empire without a flag begin? And who exactly was the man whose DNA still rules? That ghost lineage? It didn't just survive history. It hunted it. Because this was never just about war. Not really. The Mongol Empire had a secret weapon that went far beyond swords. It was blood. Every conquest didn't just end in surrender, it ended in children. Mongol generals didn't march back home. They stayed. They built garrisons, colonies, camps of warriors who didn't just claim cities. They took wives, daughters of nobles, women from every corner of the empire, Persian queens. Chinese princesses, Afghan mothers, and slowly, quietly, the conquerors became ancestors. Across the empire, sons were born, half Mongol, half local, carrying one thing that couldn't be erased by rebellion or collapse. Their father's Y chromosome, that same silent marker, passed only from father to son, started showing up everywhere, in the highlands of Pakistan, among Kazakh herders inside Persian dynasties and northern Chinese villages, like an invisible thread sewing together a continent. Scientists today call it C, M217. But make no mistake, it was no ordinary genetic event, because the spread wasn't random. It was explosive. This wasn't slow drift. This was reproductive strategy, scaled across empires. The higher the rank, the more wives. The more wives, the more heirs. Mongol blood didn't just blend, it dominated. One generation became ten, then a hundred, then thousands. And somewhere in that chaos, a single branch of this lineage took off like wildfire. Too fast. Too perfectly timed. Too widespread to be normal. Which leaves only one question. Who was the man behind it? That question haunted scientists for years, until one discovery cracked the silence. A cluster of men, millions of them all carrying the exact same Y chromosome. From the forests of Siberia to the valleys of Pakistan, from northern China to the steppes of Kazakhstan, one invisible signature kept repeating. Not similar. Identical. In 2003, a team of geneticists finally traced the pattern, and what they found didn't look like natural evolution. It looked like a shockwave. All signs pointed back to the early 1200s, right when the Mongol Empire exploded across Asia. One lineage, one man, one moment in time. And the numbers? Terrifying. Roughly 16 million men today, nearly one in every 200 on the planet, may descend from a single warrior who lived eight centuries ago. Not a legend, not a symbol, a biological fact still pulsing through modern blood. And those who carry it? They're not guesses. The Hazara tribes of Pakistan, the Bariats of Siberia, the Kazakh clans of the steppe, their oral traditions always spoke of a great Mongol father. Now, science echoes the same truth at the molecular level. But here's the twist no one expected. This super lineage, the so-called genetic empire, fits the timeline of Genghis Khan perfectly. And yet, it might not be his, because the body of Genghis Khan was never found. His tomb, still lost. No confirmed DNA, no royal seal. Just a ghost, a pattern. A wave of sons with no named father, which leaves us standing in the dark with one burning question. 
If this wasn't Genghis Khan, then whose ghost haunts our genome? To answer that, you'd need his body. But no one has ever found it. Not a bone. Not a single tooth. Not even the tomb. For 800 years, the final resting place of the most feared man in history has stayed hidden, erased on purpose, buried by silence, protected by death. Legend says the soldiers who built his grave were killed, so they couldn't reveal the location. Then the killers were killed. Then the ones who killed them were buried too. Somewhere, deep in the Mongolian wilderness, the father of empire sleeps, but his DNA does not. And here's where it gets stranger. In 2016, archaeologists uncovered high-status Mongol graves. Warriors, nobles, possibly even royal blood. But when they tested the bones, the Y DNA wasn't C, M217. It was our 1B, a lineage common in Western Europe, not the Asian steppe. European DNA, inside Mongol elites? Suddenly, the story of the star cluster got Messier. Was it really Genghis's bloodline? Or just the product of someone near him, a cousin, a general, a powerful but forgotten man whose name never made the scrolls? Some researchers now believe the legendary CM217 explosion didn't come from a single royal, but from the larger wave of Mongol warriors scattered across Eurasia, each leaving behind sons of their own, which raises something no one wants to admit. What if we've been chasing the wrong father? What if the most famous bloodline in world history? was never his to begin with, and if the real Genghis carried a different code altogether, who did we really find inside those graves? Not just conquerors, but something quieter and even more revealing. Because when scientists look past the Y chromosome and into the other half of the story, the maternal DNA, what they found wasn't noise. It was silence. The women of the Mongol world didn't leave grand armies or blood-soaked legends, but their DNA did something just as powerful. It stayed. East Asian maternal lineages, carried from mother to child, began showing up across Central Asia, Persia, even Eastern Europe. Quiet threads woven through generations, through lullabies, through kitchens, through grief. But there's a catch. Most of them weren't Mongol women. They were local. The empire had sent its men outward, to conquer, to claim, to father. But the women? They remained behind, or were absorbed. Across the former empire, the pattern repeats. Elite Mongol men, marrying, or taking, local women. From Persia. From China. From the steppes. Burial sites whisper the truth. Skeletons of power, laid next to partners of different ancestry. East meets West. Mongol warriors resting beside wives with European bone structure, or Persian mitochondrial DNA. No inscriptions. No records, just evidence, of unions that were never written, but were never forgotten. This wasn't just conquest, it was transformation. Family trees rewritten without consent. Empires reshaped not by maps, but by motherhood. Because while the Y chromosome roared across continents, the maternal line moved differently. Soft, subtle, woven into identity, not imposed on it. And nowhere does this quiet collision of worlds this unspoken fusion of bloodlines speak louder than in the story of a people still living with it every single day. The Hazaras. You don't just study their story. You feel it. They speak Persian. Practice Islam. Live in the mountains of central Afghanistan. But their faces tell another tale. High cheekbones. Almond eyes. Features that whisper of the East. Of horseback legacies and vanished empires. For centuries. They've carried an identity that never quite fit into the borders around them. And now, science catches up. Because when geneticists tested the Y chromosomes of Hazar men, they found something astonishing. Around 40% carry the exact same lineage traced to the Mongol expansion. CM217. The same star cluster that shattered the rules of population genetics. But here it is an abstract. It's personal. Because the Hazars don't just carry history in their blood. They've lived it. Their oral traditions always spoke of Mongol roots, of soldiers left behind, garrisons that never returned home, commanders who stayed, married, and fathered children in the valleys they were sent to conquer. And now, buried in their DNA, the proof has surfaced. They are not just the children of a forgotten army, 
They are what happens when empires leave behind people instead of flags. But there's something deeper here, something painful, because even as the science confirms their royal connection, the world around them rarely sees it. Persecuted, marginalized, hunted, yet genetically tied to one of the most powerful bloodlines to ever exist. That contradiction, that fracture between legacy and reality, lives in every Hazara face, and it begs a question that can't be answered in textbooks. What does it mean to carry the blood of conquerors when all you've ever known is survival? But the Hazaras are only one page, because the echoes of this empire, the sons of step thunder and silence, didn't stop here. They're still scattered across the map, hiding in plain sight. Some of them don't even know it, because what happens when a vanished empire doesn't disappear, but becomes people? Kalmyks, Tatars, Mughals, even modern Turks. Nations, born not from treaties, but from tangled bloodlines, fused identities, and centuries of forgetting. Take the Kalmyks of Russia. They live on the shores of the Caspian Sea. Buddhist, nomadic, their language, still Mongolic. Their prayers, whispered in the rhythms of the steppe. They are Europe's only Buddhist people, and they didn't arrive through politics. They were carried west by the memory of horseback, the pull of the empire, and they stayed. Then there are the Tatars, in Crimea, the Volga, the Caucasus, Muslim, Turkic, but underneath it all something older. Genetic traces from the Golden Horde, a memory of conquest baked into identity, not spoken in schools, but written in blood. And what about the Mughals? the emperors of India, Persian in culture, Islamic in rule, but in name, still Mongol. Their dynasty traced back to the same storm, sons of Timur, great-grandsons of the steppe. Even today, in Kazakhstan, some clans claim direct descent from Genghis Khan's golden line. And here's the twist. Their languages changed. Their gods changed. Even their faces evolved. But their chromosomes? Didn't. Because maps can be redrawn. Names forgotten, cultures absorbed, but DNA holds the one version of history no empire can erase. And sometimes, you find out your flag was never your beginning, your ancestor wasn't who you were told, and your face carries stories your passport never could. But Genghis's empire didn't just reshape people, it rewired the way genes travel, but it didn't stop with blood. It moved through sound, through syllables that crossed continents through names that outlived kingdoms. Because here's the irony no one talks about. The Mongols didn't spread their own language. They spread someone else's. Turkic. On paper, it makes no sense. The empire that rode out of Mongolia, that reshaped the world, ended up elevating another tongue, giving it roads, armies, empires of its own. But that's exactly what happened. As the Mongol wave surged west, it carried Turkic-speaking allies warriors, and administrators in its wake. And when the empire fractured, it was those tongues that remained. Today, the Turkish language flows through Istanbul, Kazakh echoes in Central Asia. Uyghur fills the markets of Xinjiang, not Mongolian. Turkic, a ghost tongue, piggybacking on Mongol power, now spoken by millions. Look closely, and the clues are everywhere. Khan still crowns names from Ankara to Lahore. Orda became Horde. First in Russian, then in English, then in pop culture, long after the real writers vanished, even in the deepest layers of Persian, Russian, and Arabic. Mongolera titles still linger like smoke. They didn't leave behind a language. They left behind a network. But this wasn't just words hitchhiking on war. This was infrastructure, a living silk road that moved not just trade but genes, cultures, people. The question is how? How did a genetic wave, starting from a few thousand horsemen, end up touching half the continent? How did one lineage travel faster, farther, and deeper than any other in Asian history? Because what happened next wasn't just rare. It was nearly impossible, because the speed, the scale, the sheer reach of this genetic storm had never been seen before. Not in Asia. Not anywhere. And that's when scientists did something bold. They compared it. Side by side, they laid out the biggest demographic shifts in history. The Indo-Aryan migration, the Han Chinese expansion, the Turkic waves that changed half the map, and then the Mongols. 
What they found wasn't just impressive. It was unmatched. See M217, the Mongol male lineage, spread faster than any of them. Broader, more vertically stacked in male lines. It didn't trickle. It surged. The Indo-Aryans brought her 1A, slowly, over centuries. The Han spread O, M175, methodically, village by village. But the Mongols? They didn't arrive. They exploded. A flash across Eurasia. From Korea to Crimea. From the Yellow River to the Persian Gulf. The genetic footprint of a single male origin, spreading like a wildfire, on horseback. Maps can't show it, but the Y chromosome can. It's not just who ruled what, it's whose children multiplied, whose sons had sons, and whose line kept echoing, long after the borders faded. Because dominance doesn't always look like an empire. Sometimes it hides in cells, in tiny mutations passed from father to son, carrying not just ancestry, but memory. And when you trace that memory across the continent, when you stack these lineages side by side, you're not just comparing DNA. You're comparing legacies, which raises one final, uncomfortable question. Did Genghis Khan truly rule the world, or is it his genes that still do? That question lingers, heavy in the silence, because his body is still missing. No tomb, no shrine, no royal remains to tie the myth to the man. And yet, here we are, tracing his legacy not in stone or scrolls, but in strands of DNA, not in monuments but in millions of men walking around today, unaware they carry the fingerprint of an empire that never needed to be seen to be felt. Genghis disappeared into history, but his lineage didn't, because war may break cities, and time may erase names, but reproduction outlives destruction. A single night in a distant camp, a child born to a forgotten union, a son raised without knowing who his father truly was, and suddenly an empire is reborn not in flags, but in blood. This is the part history books can't hold, because history remembers kings. But genetics? Genetics remembers fathers, the ones whose names were lost, the ones who ruled through bloodlines, not borders. And maybe, just maybe, that's where the real power lives. Not in maps, but in you. So the question becomes personal. Could your bloodline carry the shadow of a forgotten conqueror? Could the empire live inside you? without you ever knowing? And if Mongolian DNA still rules Asia, then what other ghost empires still live inside us all?